Yeah, before we start, just I wanted to say, well, thank you for having me here. It's really great honor to be here. It's my first time in Russia, so my first time in St. Petersburg as well. And so far, it's been amazing. Conference, organization, everything it was just perfectly done. So thank you for that. And well, yeah. That's me, I'm Sebastian. I'm known as ASCII Disco throughout the web. So Twitter, I'm ASCII Disco. GitHub, I'm ASCII Disco. Stack Overflow, so basically everywhere. And I usually don't do things with web video stuff because I work in the field of IoT for about six years now doing smart home stuff. Used to work in web front end, then transitioned to do more Node.js services and some Python stuff. But yeah, this is just really, well, the web DRM, the web video topic. I, I just started learning that and digging deeper into that just out of pure curiosity. Has nothing to do with my job, so just a little fun project. And yes, you might have seen that slide with all those weird letters, words, maybe, abbreviations, and, well, it does not seem to make any sense, and you might just think, what, what, what the heck is this? And for me, it was basically the same when I started digging down that web video rabbit hole, like, just don't worry, I've never heard of those as well before I started. And the thing is, you've probably used that technology a gazillion times, like I did have. So every time you play a video from Netflix, Amazon, Sky, or whatever, you're using the technologies mentioned there. And I hope that in the next 45 minutes, I can clarify some of that stuff for you. But before we go there, we take a little tour through the history of web, or as I would call it, from QuickTime to Netflix in just 25 years. So it all started in the 90s with Apple inventing QuickTime. It wasn't used on the web back in 1990. I think that happened in 93 or 94. I couldn't find some reliable information about that. But even back in the 90s, it was able to play videos with 156 by 116 pixels at 10 frames per second without any hardware acceleration, which was like amazing if you think that was all done by the software, all done by the CPU in well, 1990, which was amazing. Also, when it was used on the web, it could do live streams utilizing dial-up connections with just 9,600 baud. That's 9,600 chars per second. And you had a live stream. Well, you probably didn't enjoy that really much, but it worked. And yes, that were the good old days of Netscape. I guess we all miss them. And videos did look a bit alien back then, huh? because videos weren't native to the web. It was just some kind of foreign software, like QuickTime, with its own UI, its own Chrome, that got rendered into the browser application using the embed tag. And that got a bit better, but hasn't really changed in the two, 2002 when Macromedia actually got video into the Shockwave player. So the Shockwave player itself, it was released in 1997, but it wasn't meant for video playback until uh, 02. So they used something called the Soros and Spark codec that was loosely based on the H.263 specification. And well, it was optimized for low resolutions and small file sizes. What that means is, so I have a video here, original video that was used to test the Macromedia Shockwave player, which later on became the Adobe Flash player when Adobe acquired Macromedia. And this is the launch of a Soyuz spaceship, and this video has a duration of 43 seconds, but only a file size of 560 kilobyte. If you think about that, I mean, you could, like on a plain old floppy disk, you could have two minutes of video 
used well in that format, which is kind of amazing. I mean, you wouldn't like to watch a movie in that quality, but I think it's still pretty cool. At least back in the day, it was very, very interesting technology. But yeah, same problems as with QuickTime. It wasn't native to the browser. You had to install some external software to make it work. And well, sometimes it didn't. If you all, if some of you maybe remember the Adobe patch days, it had a lot of security flaws. And it still wasn't native to the browser. Video was still something that sat on top. Honorable mention, Microsoft developed something like Flash in 2007 that was called Silverlight. We won't dig deeper into that, but the thing is, all that these solutions had in common, that they were black boxes. So some alien piece of software that basically sat on top of your browser like a parasite, you had no control, you had no idea what was going on, it was closed software, it was a black box. That was the truth until in 2007 when Oprah came around and proposed the video tag, which meant native video for the browser. Fast forward to today. So what do we use to have moving pictures on our web pages nowadays? Yes, the video element. I mean, it's so easy, so convenient, just use the video element, give it a source, and it even has a fallback built-in. So it says, sorry, your browser doesn't support embedded videos, but hey, don't worry, you can download it and watch it in your favorite video player. You can download it, watch it in your favorite video player. But wait, what if I don't want to have other people downloading my videos? Let's do what all developers do, ask Stack Overflow. How can I disable save video as from a browser's right-click menu, blah, blah, blah? Well, the answer is you can't. You can make it harder to download, but you can't prevent it, which is like a bit like whoopsie. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to have, if I have content on a web that everyone can download it. Yes, it's the true open web, but nah. So the thing is, our video tag is the complete opposite of a black box. I mean, it makes it super easy to get to the source of what people are requesting. So, in terms of Netflix, does that mean I can just like, right click and save the video from Netflix? No, of course you can't. I mean, that's like the thing with video behind the paywall. You can't. And the reason for that is DRM. Digital rights management, well, digital restrictions management. Always depends on the person you ask. So what's this DRM thing? What does it do? DRM is not a single technology, not some piece of software that does a thing. It's an overarching term for things like authentication and user or content-specific encryption, um, key and license management, and very important, forensics and traitor tracing. So watermarking, if somebody pirates a video, tracing it back to the source, the user who originally pirated it, things like this. A lot of crypto stuff, yeah, for the encryption and the encoding and decoding, yes. To understand DRM, we need to understand its ecosystem. So or better the stakeholders or the third parties, the companies involved in DRM. And on top we have the content owners like Disney or MGM or with the upcoming World Cup, the FIFA Association. They own and they produce content and they have the rights to that content. The DRM calls are the companies that, well, provide DRM technology like Google, Apple, Microsoft. There are seven, eight different DRM technologies out there from different companies. Then we have the service providers. Those companies basically built the server-side software that encrypts the videos, drm fies them, as I would say. So this is just really the companies that built those, that, that software. Then we have the browsers, which are basically the players. 
We have the content providers like Netflix, Amazon, Sky, etc. They don't, mostly don't own content themselves. They license it and distribute it so that people can watch it. And we have device and chip vendors. Because DRAM is not only software, you also can have hardware DRAM. And mostly Chinese companies like Qualcomm, etc., they build chips that can decode and encode um, videos or decrypt and encrypt. And all these, all these companies, all these parties, they basically have something to say in this whole DRM ecosystem. And the thing is, I don't know how many of you use Netflix or a similar service, but have you ever wondered when you're watching a video, let's stick with Netflix, watching a video on Netflix in your browser, why a video has such a crappy quality, like it's only SD resolution, but when you walk over to your Apple TV or Chromecast or your Android TV box, it plays exactly the same content in full HD or 4K. Like, it's the same network, so there's no bandwidth problem. It's just like magic. One box plays it with full resolution 4K, and my browser only plays it in SD. Also, DRM is responsible for that. So, the content owners, like I said, Disney or FIFA or whatever, they are afraid of, well, pirates or people stealing their content, and they still, they just want to make it as unattractive as possible. So they differentiate between three ways of videos being decrypted and decoded. Just via software, that is what um, Firefox and Chrome, for example, do. This is considered less secure. So what do the content owners think? So they, they say, okay, this is the least secure environment. So what do we do? We only ship like bad quality content so it, that people don't want to like steal our content because it has such a bad quality. Then there is the hardware assisted um, environment. The hardware -insisted, assisted environment means that the DRM is baked mostly into the, into the operating system, like it is with Android and Windows and iOS, for example. Hardware assisted means it can utilize, for example, the GPU to decode the videos and just spit out the already rendered frames to the browser so that there's like not many options to grab that videos. And the most secure environment is the full hardware uh, environment where you have basically no, no software right away at all. Uh, you have hardware, the chips itself, decoding, decrypting, and rendering the videos, which is true for Apple TV, for example, or for uh, a few Android TVs and TV boxes. So they are specifically certified to, with special chips to uh, do everything on the hardware. But if we're dealing with browsers, we're mostly living in the environment of just pure software decoding. At least that's true for Chrome and Firefox. So which of the major browsers uses which DRM system? Chrome and Firefox use the Widevine system for DRM. Divide Vine CDM. This Divide Vine is actually a company that belongs to Google and licenses their software, their DRM software. So Firefox basically downloads, and we see that later, um, the DRM library to decrypt and decode the things from Google. Apple uses their own system that goes back in the days, like or dates back in the day when they introduced the iPod and iTunes. They invented the Fairplay DRM, which is in many ways very different to the others out there. <laughs> and they still use it. So if you watch a video in Safari, you use Fairplay DRM. And Microsoft also has their own DRM system, which is called Play Ready, and it's built in right into Windows. For the rest of the talk, we're going to stick with the white wine system because it's the well, most used system, and it exists in two flavors. So one, which is only software, and also certified chips, which can do full hardware decoding and decrypting of the videos. 
Well, this snippet uh, is actually from the Firefox sources. So you can download the raw Widevine binary that is used to decrypt any code from Google's Edge servers. You can just go, to, because the Firefox sources are open source, you can go there and check out where Firefox is downloading your DRM system, the Widevine system from. I've mentioned CDM now a couple of times, so what's that? CDM means content decryption module. It's some piece of soft or hardware, and it says it can decrypt the data that is coming in and let the video tag in a browser example that handle the rendering, or and that is the most used way of using uh, CDM. It can decrypt and decode and then pass the raw video frames back to the browser. And theoretically, per specification, it could also render those things directly on the hardware, so on the GPU, and um, pass the result of that back to the browser to be displayed. In the wild, the most I've seen so far is that it used, that it's used to decrypt and decode and then passes the video frames to the browser for rendering, not using the GPU. That's at least the case for Chrome and Firefox. So, how does this all play together? I think we should take a look at the browser decryption and decoding layers, which separate into the JavaScript application. So that is the thing that basically tells the computer which video we're going to, or we want to watch. We have the browser, which is, well, the player, which plays the video content. We have the content decryption module, just explained that. And down there, we have the trusted execution environment. So is it software decoding? Is it hardware decoding? And something, I named digital rights management here in the lack of better wording. I would say this is all the crypto stuff actually happening that is used to decrypt and decode videos. I really wasn't able to come up with a better name, so I just got stuck to digital rights management there. In DRM terms, that means the JavaScript application and the browser are called the DRM player, while the content decryption module is called the DRM client, and the crypto stuff and the, and the uh, execution environment are called the DRM core, where again, core, the core is basically there for doing the heavy lifting in the DRM ecosystem. Well, that is the high level picture of what happens when you play video in your browser. I admit it's a bit confusing. There's lots of arrows and lots of, lots of colors. So throughout the rest of the talk, we will walk over it step by step alongside with some real world code examples to give well, a better understanding, at least I hope. I will do this using a real world example in our case, Netflix. So I have a demo here. Just bear with me for a moment. This is something I built for debugging while I was, well, trying to reverse engineer Netflix. What this thing will do is we'll play a video from Netflix with Netflix's video D a video ID, so this is the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, um, outside of the Netflix UI. If, yeah, works. Well, was a bit tricky, so I needed to use a VPN because the video wasn't available over here. Uh, yeah, but it works. So this is like a bit of stripped down version of the tool I use for debugging. It's not yet open source, but hopefully will be some time in the future. I'm just a bit afraid of uh, getting sued by Netflix and getting a letter from the lawyers at the moment. So I hope that I'll clarify, that I can clarify this and actually be able to open source this because it's more like an educational piece than, it's not illegal in any way, I would say. Uh, wait. So, oh, 
when I started reverse engineering what is happening when you play a Netflix video, I think I did what most of you would have done as well. I, first of all, did take a look at all the requests the Netflix UI is doing when I start a video. And, well, shit, that's a bunch of requests. Like, a lot of cryptic URLs. But if we actually reduce that to the amount that is needed to play the video, we're only stuck with those three requests. The manifest, the license, and actually down here, this is the first chunk of the video, so like the first two minutes or something like that. So to get a better understanding, I'll have some code in the next slides. The thing is, fair warning. So the Netflix player J JavaScript file is over 76,000 lines of code. Ours will be less. <laughs> but still, I mean, we won't be able to have everything, every detail on the slides to make a working, well, implementation. But I think I'm able, at least I hope, to give enough details to, for you to understand what the code, like the basics of the code that is needed to do playback for a DRM secured video. Well, this is, this is the boilerplate code. We start with this. But before we dig deeper into the functions, we need to get familiar with one more technology, which is EME, encrypted media extensions. It's not a technology that does any decoding or decrypting, etc. It's just a browser API. It's more or less just like an interface to a content decryption module, to the key system, which lives inside the content decryption module, the license key server, where we get our license from to, that grants us to play the content, and the packaging service. The packaging service is, well, nothing more than some content delivery network where we get the actual chunks of, well, video from. So, let's start with the key system configuration. The thing is, this, <laughs> this differs from provider to provider, so this configuration here, it's valid for Netflix, but it's not, I mean, valid for Amazon. So every provider and every DRM system sets up their own configuration. In that config, we need to tell the backend system which kind of content types we support, with which level and which level of robustness in the trusted execution environment we actually can offer. If we have a hardware security coding or just a software security coding, and we're basically telling then later on the system which kind of hardware will be used to play back, which kind of hardware and software will be used to play back the videos. And that, in the end, will determine the content quality. So after we set up our config, we're going to take a look at the initial media key system generation. Sounds scripted, but really isn't. This is the part where we start interacting with our content decryption module with the Widevine system. So we, first of all, start with applying the config we just generated, which was just static in our case. Important thing here, we need to tell this API, it's a perfectly fine normal browser API, it sits on the navigator namespace, which kind of DRM system and which kind of key system we're using. In our case, it's, again, Widevine. The next step is not necessary for all systems, but it's, well, again, provider-dependent, but necessary for Netflix. So we need to apply to our media keys a server certificate. The cool thing about the server certificate, it's just in plain text in the cadmium.js file from Netflix. So you can, it's just, a bunch of text you can copy over. And um, when we apply that to the media keys, everything that, it, all the communication between the licensed server and our browser is secured by that server certificate, which is actually kind of a neat feature in the system. Once all that is done, we just need to reference our original video element and say, okay, this is, this is the key system we want to use. This is hello video tag. Let's bring both of you together, period. 
we already add the last function that is needed in our boilerplate here to set up the video system, which is the DRM uh, session or the media key session. This is, at least when I started, well, learning about this, it was extremely cryptic because it was a lot of binary blobbish things happening. And it was really, really nothing like I've, I've seen before. The thing is, the inner data is also provider dependent. It's, a, it's just another bunch of config data that gets passed to the content decryption module. And also this inner data, it's also just in plain text, well hidden in a few functions in the Netflix player file. So I could just copy that. Um, if you serialize it and base64 it, it looks a bit like this. So just some cryptic stuff that gets passed to the content decryption module and that signs the requests with it. When we call create session on a media keys object, we need to tell it which kind of video we're supporting, which is MP3, uh, MP4 here. Um, it gives us back the context for the actual message exchange with our CDM system. So this is basically the session for communicating with our Widevine CDM. Nothing more and nothing less. We also have, again, for Netflix, apply the server certificate in base64-ish form again here. But all of this config in the create session is, again, provider dependent and DRM system dependent. The last function down here, the key session generate request, takes then this init data that is, again, just another bunch of static data, as I explained and um, builds the license request in the background, or the CDM, the content decryption module, builds then the license request in the background. So the raw binary data we need to send over to the license server to get a valid license in exchange. Um, interesting here is CENC. This is, well, just an ISO standard. It's called common encryption. And it defines the protection scheme um, for MP4 videos. WebM has something different, well, it's called different, but does exactly the same thing, etc. So that was, it was really hard for me to find out what CENC, this abbreviation, what it actually meant, but it's just a standard for, well, encrypting things, protecting things. Important bit here is that event listener that we're setting up. Um, when this event is called the message event on the key session, we know that we're ready to retrieve the license from the license server. So, and in that callback, we do nothing more than a plain request, um, this case a post request to the license server, which also, well, varies from provider to provider, of course, get back some binary data, and just use that data and update our session, our existing session with the license. So when we, got, when we got back a valid license from the server, we know and our CDM knows that it can decrypt and decode the videos. If we apply that to this diagram I, I've drawn, it's quite easy. So we want to play a video. JavaScript app says, hey browser, I want to play a video. Uses encrypted media extensions and that then asks the Widevine CDM on the license functions in there for a license request. The license request is then get passed back to the browser and we can actually exchange the license request for a valid license from the license server. And then we just need to pass that license all the way back to the CDM. This is basically the what the code that we've just seen in the past slides does. Thing is, we haven't played a single second of video yet. So this is all like, all that we need to do in order that once in the future we will be able to play some videos. Whoops. I was actually afraid that that will happen. <laughs> um, 
So, one more technology we need to explore before we are actually able to play videos, which is kind of like, I would say, the stepsister of encrypted media extensions, the media source extensions. It's also a browser API. It has absolutely nothing to do with DRM. I see it as a programmatic interface to the video elements source. All it does, all it allows us to do is we can create some binary streams in JavaScript and apply chunks of video to the video element. So we basically just make the source of the video tag dynamic. And then we can use that media source extensions, instantiate it and reference it to our video and load the chunks of video piece by piece and apply it to the video tag. Because the thing is, you don't want to like, if you watch a movie that is two hours long, you don't want to download the whole movie and then start watching it. That would be ridiculous. What you do is you slice it into small chunks and apply that to the video element. So each chunk is like 30 seconds or two minutes, always depends, and apply that piece by piece to the video element. So, once we have our media source buffer ready and linked to our video element, we can add a source buffer. The source buffer just, well, we need to tell it again which kind of video format and which kind of codecs we're using. It's not like that we've done that before, but we need to do it again. Um, and so when that source open event then is, then uh, will be caught, we know that the source buffer can be created using the media sources add source buffer method. When all that is done, we can start to fetch the single chunk. So this is just some URL I made up where we can fetch a chunk of video, which is again the 30 to two minute or whatever piece of video and send that with the append method on our source buffer to the video element, like dynamically created video. There's some other cool, well, use cases for this out there where people interactively creating videos in the browser, like without requesting like pre-rendered chunks from the server, like using that as to make art and stuff. That's really interesting. Um, but we won't dig deeper into that yet. So um, this is nearly the last step that we have to go. We have our content uh, delivery network, we get the chunks, and then the browser sends the encrypted and compressed chunks to um, the CDM, which does the encryption and maybe the decoding, and it then sends back the decrypted and uncompressed chunks to the browser to be rendered and displayed. But there's one more thing. When do we actually, so how do we know which kind of chunks we need to load from where and when. And this is where the last part comes in, the last missing request, I would say, from the manifest. When we query Netflix for a manifest, it needs a, a lot of data. It's, it's, uh, so this is just a snippet, it goes all the way down there. There's a lot of usage data and analytical data as well in there. But the first of all, the, the interesting thing for us as we just want to play the video is which DRM system we're using, Bytevine again, which video we want to watch. This is the Netflix ID, you can copy that from the URL. And the profiles. The profiles actually determine in which quality, which resolution we get the video or which audio tracks we get, like audio tracks in other languages, or stereo, Dolby Digital, whatevers, and also subtitles, which is really interesting. So we need to declare all of that in the profile section here, everything we want to have in the manifest. The manifest itself, the most mostly used commonly used format is MPEG dash. Like Apple again uses something different called HSL, which, basic, which looks a bit like the old Winamp player files, which is kind of weird, but interesting. But 
Videvine and also Microsoft PyReady, they use Impact Azure as the format, which is an XML-based format, and it defines everything, duration, buffer sizes, content types, well, which ch chunks to load when, um, chunks for different resolutions, and the cool thing is, this enables us to do something called adaptive bitrate switching. This is the thing, so you watch, you watch a movie on your computer, and then, for example, your download rate drops, but the movie doesn't stop playing. It just, the quality gets very pixelish and bad, but it keeps continuing without pausing. This is, well, what we call adaptive bitrate switching, because we have the same chunks defined in that manifest for different resolutions, and it, they ha all have the same duration, the same indexes, so when our download rate drops, the browser can just switch to a lower resolution stream and download that, which is actually a pretty neat feature because we can continue watching without pausing or buffering, and that, that is one of the best features that this whole system brings with it. This is what a manifest looks like. That was actually for the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Um, so as I said, we have this uh, adaption sets here, and they define, for example, uh, with this bandwidth, people get uh, video in that quality. Uh, we have that audio, which is English audio. Impaired with this some accessibility feature, like we have extra audio tracks for people with impaired um, hearing. And down there, it's actually text, some kind of XML, which are the subtitles. We have the duration and the starting point of the video, because when you, like this Netflix feature, for example, when, when you stop watching a video and restart it again, uh, you start at nearly the same point, which is taught us by the start property here, where to start. Um, again, we have the robustness level, which tells us, hey, okay, this is the video chunk. You only can, like, do the playback if your system uh, has these requirements fulfilled, which is hardware secure codecs, so hardware assisted decoding in this case. You can, as I said, define as many chunks as you like for the same part of the video with different resolutions, and within that representation, you then get the URL where to load the chunk from. That's the last cryptic URL you've seen from the Netflix requests. And the range is, just says, okay, this is like starts at, um, well, second or millisecond zero and goes up to X other seconds. Which is actually the last part. Mostly you get the manifest also from the CDN. Sometimes some providers have an extra server for that to handle that. But mostly as the delivery for the video chunks um, sits on the same machine as uh, the manifest functionality, it just, make, it just makes sense to have it in one system combined. And when we download the manifest, then we know um, which chunks we need to load, and then we can just request the chunks and do the thing I've just explained, like getting them decoded and uh, decrypted from the CDM. So basically that was it. Now we can watch for, well, videos from any provider out there. But because Netflix thinks that this is too insecure, they've added something on top to encrypt the messages sent between the browser and the server. Something they call message security layer, or in short, MSL. This is totally Netflix specific. Uh, I've seen, well, people building open source alternatives for the Sky player, for the Dazen player, and for the Amazon player, and everything I've told you so far would have been enough to play the videos from them. But not for Netflix. So, they implemented this because, well, out of many reasons, one of them was HTTPS isn't secure enough for us. Okay. Good thing is they open sourced it. So we can, well, have a look at the source itself and see how it, how it works. It has nothing to do with web media directly. It's just really some message encryption layer. To be honest, I won't even try to start and explain what is happening there here probably could set, up a, could set up a whole talk or a whole workshop about MSL only. 
if you want to inform yourself, Netflix actually themselves wrote a very good blog post about it in 2014 on their tech blog that gives you like the rough picture what they're doing, why they're doing it. And they have an open source implementation on GitHub. So uh, Netflix slash MSL, there's a huge detailed wiki with all the implementation details and working implementations in JavaScript and Java, which was perfectly, well, perfectly fine for me because I could just copy most of the stuff for my, well, little project directly from Netflix. And there's a Python implementation, which actually I wrote together with two friends. So that was when we actually first started reverse engineering. Um, this is my GitHub Askidisco, the Prog and Video Netflix repository, which is basically a full-blown open source client for Netflix working with the Kodi Media Center. Um, so we choose that that we don't need to care about the rendering. You could theoretically plug in a VLC player or any other rendering software in the back, but this does all the MSL stuff and requesting videos from Netflix, et cetera, working with the Netflix API. You can just install it and test it. It's, as far as I know, the only working open source Netflix client out there. Back to, well, to the start, I'd say. In fact, what we did then, after you've seen what was all needed to implement this, how often I mentioned CDM, this black box that gets downloaded from Google in case of the Vitevine CDM, we turned our video back into a black box. Our wonderful open video element is now black boxed again. We added some piece of foreign software that does all that heavy lifting for us. And it's a piece of software we don't know the source of. It's closed sourced. All of the systems are. It's something we're not in control of. It can, it can do many things without being noticed by us, like doing tracking and analytics and sending data somewhere, most probably to the big G, because, well, it's owned by them, the Weidwein CDM at least. Yeah. Black box again. Let's ask Sir Tim Berners-Lee what he thinks about this. Tim Berners-Lee says, he basically approves, he says, so in summary, it is important to support encrypted media extensions as providing a relatively, relatively safe online environment in which to watch a movie, as well as the most convenient and one which makes it a part of the interconnected discourse of humanity. Well, at least, especially the last part here that makes me think that he might have had some drinks before he gave that interview. No, um, I mean, it's Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He knows what he's talking about, for sure. He invented the internet. Well, but there are other opinions about this. One is from the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, which, until all this DRM stuff happened, was a member of W3C. And they say, in 2013, the Electron Electronic Frontiers Foundation was disappointed to learn that the W3C had taken on the project of standardizing encrypted media extensions, an API whose sole function was to provide a first-class role for DRM within the web browser ecosystem. So we will keep fighting to keep the web free and open. We'll keep suing the US government to overturn the laws, the laws that make DRM so toxic, and we will keep bringing that fight to the world's legislators. Also, interesting words, statement. The thing is, I can't tell you what you should think about this. I don't even know if I myself know what to think about this. On the one hand, I'm always advocating for a free and open web and not having some closed source shit in our browsers that we don't know, that we can't control, that we not know of what it does, which request it sends to where. On the other hand, I know we need to have services like Netflix and all the others which have video behind the paywall. We need to have that. Otherwise, maybe they would turn away, turn their back on the web and just, well, 
use apps and the web would be abandoned for such content? I don't know. I mean, make up your own mind, please. And with that, spasiba. Thank you for listening. Uh, questions? Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a bunch of questions because I'm uh, trying to dig into this theme uh, for four days already. <laughs> uh, but I think I will talk with you later. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I wanted to ask now, uh, did you try to encode your own video using Widevine? Uh, not using Widevine. So the thing is, with Widevine, you would actually need to have a license from Google. Yeah. And to get the, that license, you need to send one of your engineers to be certified. You need to send them over to California for one week of training. Then the engineer gets certified. Then you have a chance to get the license to use Widevine with a certified engineer on board. And then you're actually allowed to do this. So I haven't really... Like uh, even as far as, far as I, I understand from Widevine uh, website, uh, this certification is not required uh, to use to use DRM for for yourself. Well, uh, this certification required only if you want to sell it like service. A friend of mine who runs a business that is. Well, about um, mostly providing video solutions for hotels, etc. He, well, basically his lawyer asked Google if that is needed. And they replied to him that, or oh, Widevine, because it's the Widevine company, it's not Google directly. Um, and they replied that it is still needed to have one, of cert uh, one certified engineer on your team. I'm not sure. I've seen I've seen the same information on on the web page of theirs. It's also not very specific about uh, if you're allowed and when you are allowed to download actually that library from the Google servers, and if you're then actually allowed to use it or not. It's not really specific on the page. So I'm afraid I can't help you with that. <laughs> Uh, okay, and one more question. Uh, all this security uh, provided by uh, closed source encryption model, decryption model. Well, so I if it would be open source, there is there will be no no security. I guess. I would not say no security. I think no protection. I mean, also. I think it is possible to have open source content, DRM-ish like content uh, encryption, because I mean other uh, encryption systems are open source as well, and they're, they're not cracked, they still work. So I think it would be possible to have an open source version, although I'm not really, I'm not a crypto expert. I just think it would be possible to have something like this. This is my pure developer meaning. Uh, I just can't understand uh, what can... Uh... I think, for, for example, Widevine, PlayReady, FairPy, all those DRMs, they're not open sourced because the companies want to make money with them and they want to have licenses and all those trainings, etc. They want to sell this. So this is just my personal opinion. This is why they're not open. Also, maybe because they're doing this analytic stuff, we can't really, can't really be sure if they're doing it. I'm just, I just believe they do. And yeah, I think those are the two main problems why we don't have an open source DRM out there. Mostly money, because the answer to everything seems to be money these days. But, but there is no uh, Netflix downloader. There is no any program that you can use to download HD quality video from Netflix. Mm. Oh, there is. I don't want to lie, but I don't really want to give an answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
any questions? Uh, so you said about uh, generating the certificate uh, for uh, the decryption. Uh, do we have uh, to do it uh, each time we load the video or we can just generate it once and then reuse it? The answer is it depends <laughs> on the system used. Um, I mean if I use, uh, if I create a service for usage like Netflix like you showed, uh, may I just uh, generate one certificate and then just play uh, another videos with this certificate or I have to generate it for each video? So the thing is the certificate, the server certificate, it's always the same thing. It's always the same static text thingy that is, for example, a Netflix JavaScript file. But the process to create a session to the CDM and to create this whole keys and session thingy, um, you have to do that every time. It's not very, so it's not very heavy for CPU or, or RAM, so that's not a problem. The certificate itself, at least in the case of Netflix, it's just always the one same thing. It's just the server certificate and base64 uh, representation. Always the same one. You can check it out in the Cadmium JS player file on Netflix. It's just one big string. It's just there. Okay. So I had a question about the adaptive bitrate uh, stuff. Is that, is, you also said that, um, I think you said chunk length varies, um, and, and sometimes it's just like a couple of minutes or something. Is the ability to do that bitrate adjustment based on bandwidth uh, coupled then to the length of the chunks? Like, is that the most frequent that it can change uh, uh, the quality, or can it do it in the middle of a chunk, or? It can do it, like, that. that is up to the implementation of the player. So what I've seen most is, especially when a movie starts, you have a few requests for the same chunk in, with different resolutions. So, or the same, no, it's, it's, it's different chunks, so it's the same time of the video, which are different chunks, and when it starts, I think we see one, if I go back all the way to the requests, whoa, that's a hell lot of sites. Yeah. Um, for example, I think we see here exactly two requests for the same uh, date time of the thingy. And um, as far as I know, um, Netflix or does determine every 30 seconds what your bandwidth actually is if there is a drop. So they already did it with some kind of polling mechanism before we had the performance APIs in the browsers. And um, then they can adjust that. So they can switch during, I mean the player implementation is able to switch during the same chunk. You don't need, have, you don't need to wait for the next chunk. But um, also, the player implementation, as well as I understood it, uh, it downloads one complete chunk and buffers that, so that you really have, like, in between chunks, the possibility to switch. Actually, it could theoretically work to switch while the same chunk has been played, but as this thing is buffered, it's not really needed. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Sebastian. Thank you.